while we're getting started, but I kind of want to ask you a few questions. Yeah. So I really want to know like what kind of web apps or what kind of what web framework you're using day by day. So if I could start by showing a raise of hands who uses Angular. Okay, interesting. What about React? Okay, a little bit more. And what about Ember? <laughs> yes! There is one guy! I'm not the only Ember developer in Iceland. That's great to know. So, I'm Ayer. I usually explain my name by eye and ear. So, <laughs> that's a pretty good way of, yeah, when I'm outside of Iceland. People usually don't forget. And I work at Arantia. We make websites, web app, web games, and our main focus is React, but I've been doing Amper for the last year, so I decided to give you like a high level overview of Amper. Like, how is it different? Why would you want to use it? But I'm gonna start by talking about React. Have you ever had this feeling when you were doing your first <laughs> React app? <laughs> Amper kind of solves this problem in letting you more focus on the actual app itself rather than your build <laughs> config. So, what is Amper? Of course, the main important bit for every web framework is they have a mascot. And it comes in many different <laughs> types, one for each location. And of course, they have swag. But to go, go on a more serious note, th this is kind of their statement. It's a framework for creating ambitious, ambitious web applications. So if you think about React, which is more focused on the view, view layer, they're more focused on like the whole thing. You're making an app a web app, so all from the view, controller, route, how you talk to the, to, to the API, and just the whole pack. And they're kind of, you can kind of compare them to Ruby on Rails, where by default everything is by convention, so you can kind of just make a new Emperor app and start running, and focusing on kind of your, the implementation of your own web app. And I would say that there's like, it's evolutionary, not revolutionary. What I mean by that is, so it has been around since, two, since 2011, and it has changed a lot since then, but they kind of do it in small steps and have a good process around that. And they also look around to the other frameworks, what they're doing, and take good ideas from, from them. And their focus is also on stability. There's a lot of like the big companies are betting on this for their developers, where they have like many teams of many developers. So they kind of need, need stability. And they do that by doing a similar thing as Chrome, where they have a six week release process. And Canary is basically just master of the repo. And uh, they also, uh, on top of that, they have feature flags. So maybe if they're making features that maybe take more time, you can kind of uh, enable features that you want to try out on master. But every six weeks, basically, master com becomes a new beta. And then six weeks after, that becomes a stable release. And what they added, I think, early this year or, or late last year was long-term support releases. So Ember 2.4 was an LTS release. And that means that uh, for companies that don't want to be always updating the framework, they should go on an LTS release because bug fixes will make their way into that, uh, that version. So you don't need to be, so you can basically update to get the bug fixes without getting the new features. So they say, like, if you want to upgrade like once or twice a year, this is a good thing. But 
if you don't want to follow the six week release cycle. And uh, not long ago, they updated to Amper 2. And I mean, you probably all heard of Angular 2 that everyone is afraid that Angular 2 is coming and it's so different and we need to learn everything. <laughs> I don't know if that's correct, but with Amper, they kind of, when they are changing, they start by deprecating things. So uh, the only change they did from going to 1.13 to 2.0 was to remove all the code that had already been marked as deprecated. So if you're doing, if you're on 1.13 and you had like fixed all the warnings that had been complaining since, you know, 1.0, then you could just change to 2.0 and that's good. So they're kind of just going up a major release just to kind of clean the code base, get rid of all the stuff that they had already decided to drop. But it's still like every six weeks, maybe you get a few deprecations. So it's kind of easy if you follow their release cycle to like gradually upgrade and suddenly your code is just completely different. So, but like, what is it? What are the core concepts? Like, I think the main thing about Amper, what's, what I really like is the focus on the URL. It kind of, the state usually just starts from the URL. So, like you see here, uh, go to slash rentals. Uh, and we have a JavaScript uh, for the router, where you just like, say all the routes similar to to all the web frameworks uh, and then we have a handler for each route and what the route handler is responsible for is to get the data in this case it's using this dot store dot find all which is a part of ember data but instead it could just be on on simple JavaScript object an array or a Maybe just use FATS to FATS uh, JSON API or something. And just anything that returns a promise. And then the model get hunted to the template. I don't know if you see it, but so like here is we have the model and that it's passing the model to a few components. So usually the template is responsible for like picking which components to use and these components has like a, well, I can show that next. So this is a really simple component, but a component composites of a JavaScript file and a template file. And this is just a simple button. And when you click it, it, it like creates this action. And, and in the then in the component JavaScript, you can just cut the action there, and you see there this dot get. Yeah. So if we first look at the first line, the login is this is the, how we do dependency injection. So service is basically just a singleton object, and uh, we get it like that. And then in the action itself, it just uh, uses get to get the instance of the service that has been injected and then calls a met method on that. What we can also do in the template itself, say if we have a loop, we're looping through all the users, we can actually like just pass in the user ID. So I would just put user.id uh, behind the name of the action and then I would get that as a, par as a parameter to the action. So. Amper has recently, like now in, in the after 2.0 release, they moved more to Amper in, the, in thinking about data down and actions up. So you mainly just pass uh, data into the components and then tell them which action to call for the different action it, it supports. So Ember CLI, this is the CLI tool. So you can just install it with NPM, and then you can call uh, 
Amper, new, and then the name of your app, and it just generates a new app with everything. And then you do Amper server, and it creates a development server. And it's like, this is the reason why it's so easy to get started, to get up and running. And if you want to add, install an add-on, you do Amper install, name of the add-on, and it just also generates the code for you. Talking about code generation, I think that's like the core in Amper CLI, where you can generate uh, different pieces of code, like you want to make a new route, you do Amper G or Amper generate route, name of the route, and then it will create like the base code for you. You can basically fill in the blanks. And the good thing about the code generation is that it Amper is really focused on testing, so it always, if you're creating, if you generate a component, it will both generate a base for a component and then a unit test for you. So when you do like, when you run Amper test, it will automatically like run all the tests. And Amper data is, is what we saw before when, you, when we were fetching the model for the route doing this dot store dot find all of, uh, of of some type of model so this is kind of how amper data works so we we call find on the store or we query the store we we want to get some piece of data and there are basically three main parts to it it's the adapter the adapter is just knows how how to talk to the API, knows how to communicate with the backend. And then we have serializers, which know how to just turn that response into models. And yeah, and then we have the models which store the data. So you cannot just, you ask the store for some data, maybe you ask it for all users, or you query users with a certain name or something, and you just get like, a list of models back, but then that had gone through the adapter, talking to the API, through the serializer, and back through the store. So, with for example, if we would use the Amper CLI to do code generation, we can generate a model. We can generate a user. We say we want name and age, and then. It would just spit out this code for you, and you could start querying or adding users to your app. What I've been using in my current project is called JSON API, and that's basically just a specification on how to how to return your data from your API. So if you written an API that returns JSON. You think like, how should I handle pagination, or how how should I kind of how how should the format of the JSON be? And JSON API, it's JSONAPI.org, is just a specification of all the different kind of use cases. And this comes into like convention over configuration that Amber has a JSON API adapter and serializer built in. So if you have an API that knows how to talk JSON API, how to return this, uh, how to use this specification, then it's kind of just plug and play. You can just point Amper to the API, set up your models, and you're good to go. Uh, and another great thing with this, in my experience, has been when we're implementing new features, and we have a separate person that handles the back end, and then I'm on the front end. So we want to do a completely new feature. Uh, the first thing we would do is just me and the back end developer would sit down, of course, discuss the features, but then write up the JSON API specification. So we kind of say, like, okay, the API needs to behave like or return. Uh, the data like this and then I can on the front end just mock the API 
using the same JSON API responses, and the backend guy can implement the API on and use his unit test to test it. And then we can just do the work in parallel, and and then it just plugs plugs right in when we're done. So React. <laughs> Some of you have, have used React, and it's usually, yeah, people usually talk about the framework wars. It's like Angular, Ember, React, they're all fighting, and everyone is trying to be the best. But it's not always like that. It's really impressive to see the collaboration between the teams, and that, that like, React and Ember are both taking ideas from each other, to, to be better. So if we, for example, with Ember, it has, it started with two-way data bindings all the way, but after React came, they figured out, yeah, okay, data down action app is actually a pretty good idea and, and just makes everything more performant. And then, Another thing with rendering perf performance, I remember there was some conference where they had this classic like list of thousand items or all, all rendering changing and they showed like, oh, React does it so fast. Here's Emperor shitting his pants. <laughs> and like, and soon after the Emperor team announced that they were doing a new rendering engine called Glimmer and they actually sped up the rendering by 10 times and were kind of then on a similar level to React and being able to handle cases like that, which are not common in actual web development, <laughs> at least not in my experience. So React, what has React learned from Ember? For example, React Router is heavily inspired by Ember router, and they are actually really interested in reusing bits from the Ember CLI uh, to kind of avoid, like I showed on the first slide, this hello world trying to get everything together. So it will be really interesting to see how that turns out. But then also for like their development process, so Ember has something called RFCs, which stands for Request for Comments. So when they want to add a new feature to Ember, they start by just doing, so they have a separate repo on GitHub for this, which is just a list of markdown files. So you have an idea for a change on Ember, and they just make a new markdown file, discussing like the summary and what is, what is the goal, what, my, what are the problems. And then just the Ember community like discusses the idea and like it evolves over time. And it's a great place to just, yeah, get feedback on the idea instead of like going into a code and just doing something and then later figuring out, oh, maybe this was a bad idea. <laughs> to, so, so React is moving towards this as well. And it's also really nice for me as a developer that I can just go in there and I can see like where the framework is heading and, and kind of what the core team is interested in changing. And, and I have a good, good quote here from Yehuda Katz, one of the creators of Ember. All good ideas will eventually end up in Ember. And <laughs> I feel like just the community believes in this. They're kind of just, I don't know how to explain, but there is a really, yeah, how's the community? There is a really strong community. And, and the main, main discussion happened on Slack. It is actually really nice when you're working on different parts of Ember that you can just go into the Slack channel for that piece of Ember and just have a discussion with the core team. 
They also have a discourse forum, just like a web discussion board. But I feel like the Slack channel is way more useful and there are a lot of like people are willing to, to just spend time helping beginners uh, taking their first steps. And also the add-on community has been growing a lot. This shows from late 2014. It has just been growing since then. And I feel like now, you know, I can find add-on for most things, just like the other big frameworks. So testing, testing is kind of the big benefit of Ember, how they kind of embrace testing and like with the code generators, they kind of you know, make the test for you. Like if you generate a model for user, this is an example of a test. It's not really testing anything, but you still have, have the imports, have one simple test, which you can just go go ahead and modify and test your logic. logic. And also really nice for doing test and development. So when you, you can use the Ember CLI to run Ember test and either just run using PhantomJS in your terminal or use a Q unit. So just basically just it fires up a browser and then it has Q unit open. And every time you save a file, it will run the test again. So this is an example of a unit test where you just have, uh, you're just like testing a specific functionality on, you can test a, a service or a, or a model. For components, we use integration tests and then you're more testing as the user of the component. So you're not like testing the JavaScript object, you're more like you're rendering the component with different data and different like, and then you can handle the actions and you check the result. And the third type of test we have is an acceptance test. And there you're basically just testing the page as a user. You're more like clicking around, filling out forms, pressing buttons, and then you are, you know, asserting the state of the document. So this is how you would, how you do it today. You can fill in an input, put hello, click some, click a button and then assert. Uh, there is an interesting RFC open now for changing acceptance tests that you could just use await. So you await certain actions you do on the page and then you can just assert it and you kind of lose this and then helper because you're using await. For the mocking data, Mirat is a pretty nice, pretty nice uh, library or add-on. This basically allows you to yeah, mock out your API, but you're kind of mocking out the request to your server. This is like the simplest form of mocking, where you just, when, when the adapter sends a request to slash API authors, it will re respond, uh, yes, respond this JSON object. But, you can take this way further. You can add like fixtures or factories. Factories are really nice where you want to like generate, uh, generate models with random data and you can set up specific rules on what, what data to generate. And when you have that up and running, you can actually do acceptance tests like this, where you just, in the beginning of the acceptance test, you say, okay, this is the data I want to have on the server or in my mocks, and then assert that the UI is correct. And you can, there I'm just creating a list of 10 photos. You can also say like, 
what some properties in a photo should be like and and just you can set the state of the database as you want to have it another nice library to help with testing is called page objects and that's basically to define your pages in one central way it's basically to remove the need of using selectors all over your unit tests so, uh, like you saw here before you like filling in dot display title so you're filling out something with this class and then you're clicking something with this class while with page object you can just in one place describe this page so you just have the selectors there you say that username is an input that can be fillable as this id submit is a clickable button and then your test kind of turn into this just get that page object visit the page put in admin as username put in this password and then submit and then assert the result so now when i look at the tests it's like much more readable i know what's going on So the hot new topic in web frameworks <laughs> that everyone is trying to do right. Isomorphic, uh, sometimes called universal. That's basically server-side rendering. Uh, so can Ember do server-side rendering? I would answer that as almost. <laughs> We're almost there. We have a project called Fastboot. And that's basically an express middleware that is able to run the Amper app on the server. Uh, the status of it now is that it can run your web app on the server, but then it returns the, all the markup ready to the client. And what happens there, it actually runs off the Amper app again and does all the data fetching again, and that just overrides the markup. So, okay you will get the like you will see the page faster but they're still working on what they call rehydration which is like when you get the market from the server you want to be able to just load the state without like getting all the data again and and they're waiting on uh, version 2 on glimmer on the glimmer rendering engine so this is gonna happen in the next few months i hope but uh, it's really nice that at least now we can render Amper apps on the server for crawlers. So you can have like a public website, you can have different open graph tags between your pages and that will work. Yeah. So here's an example of the normal output rendered by uh, an Amper app. So you can see that it will be way better when we have Fastboot ready and we can actually have all the correct metadata in there and uh, markup for the page. So is anyone using Amper? Is it just the two of us? Or <laughs> is anyone doing it? It's actually quite surprising. This is a tweet about a year ago about the Apple Music tab in iTunes. It's actually an Amber app. Uh, this is a web app I've been working on for the last, for the last year, or one of them. And uh, this is the Nest Store. And it's nice what you see here is in the dev tools, I have the Amber Inspector open. So, yeah, I can basically see this, the state of the Emperor. I can see the different routes, I can see the data loaded, and, and more things. And there I'm just on the live site, and I can still kind of take, take a peek at what's happening. Twits, you might, might know of that. That's one big Emperor app. And if you see here, I'm just on the live site, open the dev tools. And 
On the data, I will see all my models. And here I put the game model, and I see a list of all the games here that are loaded into Amber, into the, the store. Ghost, that's a blogging <coughs> platform. Uh, trying to be better than WordPress. They chose Ember. Of course, there are many others. Here are a few of them you might know. So wrapping up, Ember is basically an all-included web framework. It just helps you focus on your web app instead of some boilerplate. And it's been around since 2011, but still under active development with a strong core team. It encourages that you write good tests or even be test driven and has a great community. If you have any questions, just ping me on Twitter or ask now if time, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Question. Yeah. So if I was just starting out and I wanted to build something, would, would you rather recommend me to listen to you and start out using Amber because it's more simple, or should I go for the app where everyone seems to be doing that? Repeat the question. So basically, I'm starting out a new project. Should I use Amber or React? Maybe why should I use Amber? Uh, it's definitely a hard question because I like both frameworks. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking the question for like a person who's just beginning to develop something. Yeah. Own, yeah, as a standpoint of building their first things. I think the benefit of using Ember as like your first project is that it has a lot of convention and it kind of it kind of forces you or shows you the way to best practices. <laughs> whatever that is, but uh, yeah, I think it's probably easier for a newcomer to start with Ember. If you have Ember CLI, you can basically generate your app and then like focus on, on one piece at a time. Uh, because it's also, it removes the need for you to like uh, choosing all the different bits to use. So if you choose React as a uh, new layer, and then what are you going to use for data, what are you use for routing, and how am I going to talk to the API? Well, there you kind of just, you know, this is just how you do a web app. Those are the different pieces you get. You still have a lot of add-ons to take it even further. But yeah, I think it's a, I think it's also a great tool for hackathons where you just, you just, doing something that talks to an API, basically a, a CRUD application, and you can just run pretty fast with the Ember CLI. Uh, I think that's also a great use case. But I, I think that the strongest use case using Ember is more for the enterprise. Like I'm working for Google on this, and they are, you know, they are a really big company with uh, lo loads of developers, and I think it's it's more of a safe bet that it, like with the release cycle and and with uh, just how the core team kind of uh, uh, takes good ideas into Ember and really cares about backwards compatibility uh, because. When I started working for them, they had like a really old version of Ember and we had to start by upgrading it to the latest one. And it was kind of nice because they weren't just not just changing all the time. They were just like deprecating stuff. And then they like have guides for for each bit, like for each application, they have like a guide how I should like what should I do instead. So yeah. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, that one more question. No? Just a quick one. Uh, I've heard that Ember has quite a learning curve to it. Uh, from your pocket, did you find the 
Okay. So the question is if uh, Amper has a steep learning curve. So I think when I was learning it, the most difficult part was outdated information on the internet. Like when I'm Googling stuff and find some solution, then it's not like that anymore. Uh, I actually uh, started by getting access to like a videos from the founders of uh, Amper. They have like a step-by-step -step introduction to Amper. I think that was really useful to just, you know, get to learn how Amper is today instead of like, I think, I think that's the hard bit about steep learning curve is the outdated information online. <laughs> but I feel like it shouldn't be too st steep today. I feel like it's getting better. <laughs> But someone here needs to go try to do some Ember and then let me know how it is. It would be really interested to know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so thanks.